The Lord be with you this wonderful Sunday morning. I hope all of you are doing well. This is an online worship experience uh, provided by Inman Presbyterian Church and Landrum Presbyterian Church in the upstate of South Carolina. Welcome to any sojourners who have wandered through and members who are seeking worship in this time of COVID. All are welcome. We do have on-site worship also for those who uh, want to bring a mask and be part of that. Before we begin, just a couple of announcements. Um, first, both churches are worshiping on-site as well as online to accommodate everybody who might have health conditions or might want to peek in on our services from afar. You're welcome. Both churches are celebrating communion the first Sunday of the month. We figured out how to do that safely uh, with sanitized cups and everything. We, we'll also be doing that online. In terms of prayer support um, in Landrum, we're still praying for Peggy. She's having a real hard time with those shingles. Please keep praying for Peggy. Um, others who we have been praying for, you can see on the list. Uh, in Inman, we just got word the end of the week that Margaret, uh, Marion and Linda's uh, relative, has been put in ICU. Uh, she has a living will. There's a do not resuscitate order. She's having a lot of trouble. She was in that nursing home in the Anderson area, so please be in prayer for Margaret as well as the Freeman family. The ongoing concerns you can see, um, Sue Ann and George and uh, Mark, Daniel's friend and the others, please remember them. Both churches, I hope, will be in prayer for Reverend Mike Turner. He's the minister at Unity Presbyterian Church in Boiling Springs. A lot of us know Mike. He's had or having surgery this week for pain management for a back issue. All right. Well, let's, let's go ahead and take a deep breath and calm ourselves and come before the living God. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, obedient to his spoken word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers that do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Let us join in a song together. You can find the lyrics at uh, inmanpres.org, the online worship page. Let us sing together to God be the glory.
Let us now come before the Lord our God, admitting those places that we need help, those places that refuse to forgive or are resistant to grace, those places that are broken and need smoothing and healing. Let us confess it all using the prayer that you see before you and then using the time of silence for your own personal prayers. I invite you to pray with me. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires know, known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and magnify your holy name. Through Christ the Lord. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Hear the good news. Believe the good news. Believe that the Lord is speaking to you this morning. That in Jesus Christ, we are all of us forgiven. Amen. <laughs> Forgiven and freed, let us consider all the benefits that the Lord has given us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Let us marvel at the love and mercy, forgiveness and grace of our God. And let us also reflect on what we might give back in honor of what all, all of what God has done for us. Use this time to honor the Lord your God. I share with you a text from the Psalms, from Psalm 114. Listen for the word of the Lord. When Israel went out from Egypt, the house of Jacob, from a people of a strange language, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled. Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. 
Why is it, O sea, that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back? O mountains, that you skip like rams? O hills, like lambs? Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turns the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a spring of water. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now turning to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Matthew, to the lectionary text for the day, found in chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Listen once more for the word of the Lord. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you seventy-seven times. For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, Have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How many times should I forgive a member of the church who sins against me? Asked Peter. As many as seven times, he said. Seven, even up to seven. And Jesus gives his famous answer. No, not seven, but 77. Or some uh, translations actually say 77 times seven. The Greek is not precise, which I'm sure is irritating to those in search of the economy of a forgiveness and I'm willing to bet that Peter thought he was being generous here. Everybody knows three strikes and you're out. He, he went all the way to seven. Why does Peter, why do we want a number in the first place? You ever thought about that? Why does he want a number? Well, I think we all know why. There's some tiresome people in our lives and we just soon... Count them out, right? The trouble is we tend to think of forgiveness as a kind of specialty tool we can whip out when we need it. Like, uh-oh, the hinge is loose. Better pull out my screwdriver and fix that. Uh-oh, the relationship is wonky. Got to pull out my forgiveness thing and, and fix it now. In this passage, Jesus is 
completely redefining, redefining our understanding of what forgiveness is. It's not a specialty tool. It's, it's more like the clothes on your back. You certainly want to, wouldn't want to leave your house without that, would you? No, I hope not. You need it constantly. You wear it everywhere. For Jesus' forgiveness is not a transaction that can be counted. Rather, it's a way of life, a way of being. Like love or grace, to be a disciple of Jesus is to live in a state of love and grace. Just like it's also to be a disciple is to live in a state of forgiveness. Scott Hosey, in his commentary on this passage at calvinseminary.edu, says, The reason God expects us to forgive as a result of our being forgiven is the same reason you can expect to be wet after diving into a lake. Water is wet, and when you immerse yourself in it, you get wet. So also, with forgiving grace, grace is magnetic and beautiful. When God immerses you in grace and saves your life eternally by it, you are dripping with grace yourself. You will be full of grace and truth, and so spread it to others. God forgives us daily. We forgive others daily. Forgiveness is our lifestyle. It's our habit. So you see, forgiveness is not something we do. It's something we are. It's a fundamental part of being Christian to be a forgiving person. So, let's get real for a second. Those are preacher words, right? When you read this and hear it, why does it feel so impossible then? It's so tempting to preach against it. Something in your heart wants to argue with Jesus. What about all those unforgivable sins, Lord? What about them? And we know what they are. The ones, woof, we don't think God will ever forgive. What about that person who keeps injuring over and over again, like Otis and Mayberry, coming back to get locked up in the jail again? Wow. When is Annie going to say, listen, Otis, go to AA. You can't come here anymore. How many times does it take? How many times do you have to be hurt by the same person? We all have those people. And while we're at it, let's wonder about the faces that come to mind that cause us to wince every time we think about this passage. We all have those people. You can't lie to me. I know I have them, and I know you have them. People whose faces come up in your minds, people who've really hurt you, or people who you've really hurt, People, we wonder if we can ever really forgive them. We try and we try and we still have those hard feelings, you know. Or people, we wonder if they'll ever forgive us. People, you know. If nothing else today, let us stand in the light of Jesus Christ and notice the smudges on our soul. I think Jesus means for us to do this at least for a moment before running on to the parable he uses to try to explain. Think of those people, those faces that the Spirit brings up in your heart and ask God for help and ask God for forgiveness and see where it goes. How many times should I forgive? Seven? No, says Jesus. Seventy-seven times seven. And then he told a parable about a king and his servant. And this servant had racked up incredible debt. 10,000 talents. How much is 10,000 talents, I hear you asking? Well, I'll tell you. It's really almost a comical number. It's like someone just made it up like, like $10 trillion. Uh, talent, a talent is actually a unit of measurement of weight. So, for instance, a talent of silver would be 130 pounds of silver. One talent. That's probably what we're talking about here. If it's gold, it'd even be more than what I'm telling you. But it's probably talking about silver. So he basically owed 
300,000 pounds of silver, which is ridiculous. And somebody, I read a source, he, he did all, crunched all the numbers, and he felt like that was worth about $379,158,000 in Jesus' day. That's not our day. Oh, my word. Can you? I can't even imagine how many trillions of dollars that'd be today. It's ridiculous. No one's ever going to pay that much money back. That's what it is. He's been caught. The only recourse is to beg for mercy. That's all he's got. And that's what he does. And the king forgives his debt. And then when he's going on his way after he's been released, he turns around and gives a beat down on one of his servants who owes him a hundred denarii. How much is a hundred denarii, I hear you asking? Well, basically, one denarii was about one day's wage. So a hundred denarii was just almost four months' wages. Now, some people, when they present this passage, say, oh, it was a trivial amount. Well, I don't know about that. Four months' wages? If I owed four months' wages in debt, I'd be kind of scared. So I don't know about the trivial part, but nevertheless, probably trivial if you compare it to 10,000 talents, sure. But nevertheless, he has the guy thrown in jail. says, you, you can't get out till you pay me back in full. Now his fellow servants that see all this are greatly distressed, and so distressed they go straight to the king to the Lord and ran them out, right? And let me try to explain to you why they're so greatly distressed. I really, my eyes were open this week when I read a commentary by Stanley Saunders over at workingpreacher.org on this passage. And he explains it really well. You have to understand, back then, the Mediterranean economy went like this. The, the goal was to pass a steady, acceptable flow of wealth further up the pyramid while retaining as much as you could for yourself that could be used to grease your way further up the pyramid. That was the game. That was the system. Everybody knew it. It was accepted. It's just the way things work. You kept some for yourself. You passed the rest up the pyramid. And you kept as much as you could get away with. Now, the unforgiving servant, he must have been near a top-level manager. That's the only way he'd be have access to that much stuff to even accumulate that much debt. He must have been like the chief financial officer or something to have a debt that high. And so this reckoning, we're told it's a reckoning that the king does in this story is meant to do two things, really. One, obviously, is to correct the behavior of the servant. You're taking too much. The second is to send a message to the rest of the system. The message to limit the honest graft. In forgiving, the king most probably expected, at the very least, that this servant going forward would have very intense loyalty to him. Oh, he's been so wonderful. I'll forgive others and I'll be thorough in all my accounting from now on. So in the king's mind, the message was sent, the situation was corrected, and the servant was released. What you have to understand is that the king's actions are not a private matter. They're meant to have consequences for the whole system, as well as the servant. Wiping the debt has a ripple effect that, that's supposed to make its way down the pyramid. The king has effectively inaugurated a regime of financial amnesty, a jubilee, not only for one servant, but for everyone in his debt. I mean, who is he going to go if he made him fulfill that debt? Who is he going to go to? He's going to go to all the people under him. Hey, you owe me a hundred, now you owe me a thousand. Hey, you owe me ten, now you owe me a hundred. So when forgiving one person's debt, the, the, the forgiveness is meant to flow throughout the whole system. 
It's meant to be the famous trickle-down effect, like water flowing down from the mountain. Financial prosperity in this case, debt forgiveness, is meant to flow and spread to everyone down the stream. But this forgiven ser servant builds a dam. He immediately encounters a, 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 another servant with a much smaller obligation and doesn't extend the grace he has received. He ignores the pleas of mercy that are exactly the same words he used. So instead of letting the stream of grace and forgiveness flow, he stops it in its tracks. And this creates suffering for his servants and their servants and on down the line. And it also dishonors the king. Instead of accepting and living out of the king's proclamation of mercy and forgiveness, he binds himself to old, the old system of greed and violence. The unforgiving servant uses his forgiveness as a license to execute judgment on others. And in so doing, he transforms the merciful king into a vengeful judge. It's not something a merciful king who wants a merciful system can tolerate. He can't tolerate that. And so he's handed over to be tortured until he pays his entire debt, which is going to be never. And so my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you, says Jesus, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. What system of justice do you choose? One where you get to count every offense in some kind of great ledger of rights and wrongs and you get to control who's in and who's out? Or do you choose the one that is the realm of the merciful king who sent his only son to pay the debt for those who could not, which is everyone? This realm requires you to give up your control, your need for a number of times you can forgive. This realm requires you to accept what the king gives you as a free gift that you cannot earn and you do not deserve. This realm requires you to give up your right to judge others for in this realm only the merciful king has that right. In closing, and on a personal note, I will sh also share that forgiveness is a growth edge for every single one of us, including me. And I know when I have trouble forgiving someone, it helps me to consider my own debt load. All the things that have been lifted away from me so freely Forgiveness sets me free. I know that when I let God forgive me in Jesus Christ, I am free to live again. And you know, you have to let God forgive you. It's there as a free gift, but you have to accept that you can be forgiven. So part of my duty this morning is to say, God forgives you. Go and sin no more. Forgiveness is freeing. And I know that when God helps me forgive someone else, and I do believe it's a gift from God, sometimes you try and you try and you still have those hard feelings. All I can tell you to do is to act as if you've forgiven them and pray to God and let God give you the gift of forgiveness. Just that, That's all you can do sometimes. And I know for me, when the miracle happens and when God helps me to forgive someone else, I am free to move on to something better. Not forgiving someone keeps you bound to all of these bad things that the Lord doesn't want you to have. I know when I live in a constant awareness of God's love and mercy, forgiveness and grace, that these things become part of me and roll off of me onto others like water from a duck's back so that we all live in this realm. 
Forgiveness is not a transaction. It's a way of living with God and other people. How many times should I forgive a member who wrongs me? Asked Peter. Seven? No, said Jesus. Seventy-seven times seven. Let those who have ears to hear listen. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to pray with me. Oh, Lord, our God, it's a, a wonderful lesson, and yes, yet a difficult one. Help us to be forgiving people. Help us to be aware of all the ways that you forgive us in Jesus Christ. Help us to share his forgiveness and mercy and grace. Help us to build a world that, that, that's rooted in this notion of forgiveness and love of one another. Oh Lord, we pray for those who need a special dose of that love today. We pray for those whose hearts have been broken by someone else. And we pray that you help them in their time of need. Oh Lord, we also pray for those whose bodies are broken in some way. And we pray that you would help knit them back together and in the meantime that you would be their rock and their fortress, their strong place in a, in a very trying time. Lord, we also are mindful of the world we live in right now. And so we pray for those who face troubles that test their patience and their sense of you, people who feel like they may be drowning in troubled waters. Oh Lord, we pray that they find the resources they need and that if we need to be those resources that you would help us to know who and how to help. Oh Lord, we also pray for places that are under particular duress. I'm thinking of those communities caught in those wildfires. Oh Lord, help those who are trying to battle that blaze. Help those who have lost their homes and businesses. Help those who are dealing with the smoke and the aftermath and how to live in the midst of that and, and be safe and healthy. We ask you to, to help those caught in those wildfires. We certainly pray for those who are battling COVID and those uh, health workers and as well as school teachers and doctors and nurses, first responders, all those who must deal with the reality of this dreadful disease and we also pray for those working on that vaccine that you would give them wisdom and courage and stamina to help that come to be as soon as possible to help your people. Lord, in closing, we pray for ourselves. We pray that you would make us forgiving people, that you would keep our eyes on your face and our ears tuned for your voice. For it is in following you that we find our life. Hear us in the name of Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
I invite you to say what you believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to join in a hymn of parting today. One of my favorites, I Danced in the Morning. My brothers and sisters in Christ, as you go back into your life and into your world, know that your Lord Jesus Christ goes with you, as does the love of God your Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. This day and every day. Amen.